Good morning, Mercy Road. How you doing this morning? Will you put your hands together? Welcome those who are attending live online right now. We're glad you're here and hope you connect with God. Uh, I- I'm excited to be with you to kick off our brand new teaching series this morning as we kick off the Christmas season. Anybody hungry? Yeah. Now, if you're like, why was the lobby so cramped this morning? Uh, we got free eggs and bacon and uh, Christmas brunch for us family style out in the lobby after the service. And we'll talk about why we're doing that here in a little bit. But we're kicking off a brand new teaching series called Christmas Together. And this morning, we want to talk about one of our core values as a church is unified community. That no one should ever be alone, particularly at this time of year. And so we're throwing a big brunch to kick off this teaching series so that we'll get to know each other as a church family. But I want to talk about loneliness, particularly during the Christmas season. Now, you may not realize it, but we probably live in one of the loneliest societies the world has ever seen, particularly within suburban culture. Like, dude, you just have to go around our neighborhoods and see we make fences to keep people out because we don't want them coming over, right? Right? We, we isolate ourselves from one another. Some of us are here this morning attending online because you know if you would have come to the church building, you would have had to talk to somebody. Who's with me? We want to isolate ourselves because the reality is we've been hurt so many times by relationships. We've talked about marriage and dating, and now I want to talk about friendship as well. But this morning, I want to talk about in the first Christmas story over the next few weeks together, how God actually used spiritual family, even beyond biological family, to help uh, bring in and usher in the birth of the Messiah, which is Jesus. So are you ready to study God's word together, church? I'm gonna invite you to turn to Luke chapter one, where it's a part of a year in the word. So we're just studying Luke chapters one and two, and we're gonna look at the role of community in the first infancy story, as scholars would call it, at the birth and the paving the way of Jesus' ministry. But before we get to the birth of Jesus, we get to the birth of his cousin first, John the Baptist. And I want to talk, you know, I think for some of us, maybe you have grown up and you have lots of community. You've grown up with a family that's very tight, very large family, love hanging out with each other. You're super social. They're super social. You have phenomenal community supporting you. Most people in our culture don't live like that. Most people live very isolated, like I described, and I shared this at the first service. You know, my wife grew up in Southern California, and it was just her and her mom growing up, and many times as a young woman, she was home alone because her mom would have to go provide, and her grandfather helped pay the extra bills, but she was often found alone in the house. And we don't understand sometimes the way that isolation impacts our lives, and so many of us who are sitting here are totally comfortable being alone and we don't know what we're missing out on. I find it very interesting that God didn't just send the Messiah, that he sent someone to pave the way first because he didn't want him to do it all by himself. In Luke chapter one, we get the telling of this incredible, miraculous story about the birth of John the Baptist. Here we go. It says in Luke chapter one, verse five, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. So descendants of Aaron were the ones who became the priests. And then it says that he was of a certain division. I read that and I was like, dude, is he like an army or something? What are they talking about division? So within the priestly duties, there were 24 different divisions of priests, which meant that each year you would be responsible for two weeks out of the year to go and perform your priestly duties at the temple. So this is Zechariah, one of his two weeks a year that he actually is going to go to the temple to serve his, in his uh, duties in the way that he should. Verse 6, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. And they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division, one of these 24 priestly divisions, was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now, check this out. So 
That seems like nothing to us, right? We don't even know what does it mean, burn incense? Is that like what you do when you got some cool vibe and jazz music going on? No, this was an act of worship that the priests would participate in to be the priest of all the priests, of all the divisions, who gets to go in and offer the burnt incense was a, 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 a role of high responsibility, privilege, and honor. It's thought that a priest might only get to do that once or twice in their entire lives. So his day has finally come. You got to imagine Zachariah's like, sweet, I can't wait to get home, tell my wife how I went in there and I just did that incense like no one's ever done it before, right? Hezekiah last week, terrible compared to what I did this week, honey. You have no idea. And look what happens, though, when he goes in to burn the incense. Verse 10, and when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. By the way, this would have been around 3 p.m. in the afternoon. I love how the Bible works. 3 p.m. is the exact time that Jesus gives his life up on the cross. It's the exact same time that the Passover lamb would have been slain. Just a little interesting note for those that like that sort of thing. They were there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon is when he would have gone in to burn the incense, or twilight is what they would have described it as. Verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. We'll learn later this angel is Gabriel. Gabriel is only mentioned in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. So even though we're familiar with Gabriel today, not that familiar of an angel in that particular time. And he goes in and standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw, saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. Now picture it for just a second. A couple of things. You finally get called in. You're going into the game, man. And I know we don't, uh, Purdue fans want to mention games today. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, that's why I, I was with you. Don't get mad. And by the way, those uh, officials in New Jersey with the Rutgers, man, they have some major problems there in that state. But I totally got sidetracked. Come back to the story. He goes in. It's finally his moment to go into the game. And he goes in there to provide the incense. In that moment, he sees an angel in the Lord. And I got to imagine, when time they describe the, an angel of God, it's shining bright light, and they're afraid. Wouldn't it freak you out that you walk in there? And then secondly, you've never really done this before. We don't know for sure. He might have done it once or twice before, but most likely he's never done this before. He may just be going, is this what always happens? Is Gabriel always standing there? And he walks in, and this occurs, and it says that he is frightened. The first Christmas story and the beginning of the infancy narrative in the Gospel of Luke begins with him being afraid because God shows up. What I want to encourage you this morning as we get into this passage, don't fear what God wants to provide this Christmas. For some of you that have lost hope during this season, you've thought that God can't show up in a way that you need that no one cares about you, and certainly God doesn't care about you. I want to tell you, the, the New Testament scriptures say over and over again, that's not true, that his spirit is with us, and that his family, the church, the local church, is meant to provide community for you in your time of need. That's what I want to talk about. Will you pray with me? God, um, I just... I know I got a little sidetracked there mentioning sports, but I pray, God, uh, that this morning, every other thought, every other thing in our lives could be set aside for just a moment. Because we packed out this room and we're trying to add chairs, God, because we believe that your spirit is with us right now in the room. Take away my words, God, because they don't need more of that. We need more of you. For those at home attending online, God, we pray that you would speak directly to our souls through this issue, that no one would be alone this Christmas, and that you might use us as spiritual family. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said. Amen. Amen. You know, when I use the term family, most of us initially probably think of our biological family. And nothing wrong with that. Certainly Elizabeth and Zachariah in this passage had been praying for that, to have a child. But I want to apply that more broadly, that in the New Testament, often when we talk about family, it's talking about something much bigger, a much bigger picture that God has. I would argue, even though I have an amazing biological family, one of the great, best moments of my life where I experienced real family was when I was in junior high. You guys remember junior high? I've shared this story, I think, once before, but junior high for me was not a fun age. I was a late bloomer. Some may say I never bloomed. I don't know. 
But I remember uh, at that time, it was an awkward stage for me. And I decided to go to the home basketball game, the varsity basketball game, which in our little town in Indiana back when I grew up was still a big deal. And I remember uh, getting into the gym and going up the stairs. And I was going up to the junior high section of the gymnasium, which we all know is at the very top so they can cause all kinds of problems and get away from their parents. And as I'm walking up there, yeah, I suddenly realize all the like cool high schoolers are like sitting right in here as I'm walking up the aisle of the stairs. And I get right in front of them and I start like puffing out my chest. Because you know, like when you're in junior high, like seniors in high school look like they're 35 years old. Anybody agree? <laughs> the most intimidating people in the world. And I, I get right in front of them. And I'm like, hey, what's up, guys? And I'm not joking. I hit the next step and wham, just right on my face, right in the steps. You're like, that was kind of dramatic. That's literally what it was like. And, you know, everybody just stares. It was so bad. They didn't even laugh. They felt so bad for me. So then as I'm getting up, I'm like trying to act like, hey, yeah, I meant to do that, you know? And then I kind of trip again. And then this uh, one person here thinks that's really hilarious. <laughs> Thanks for laughing at my pain. No, that's awesome. Uh, I, I remember <laughs> at that moment being so embarrassed, seeing all these high schoolers looking at me. And this friend of mine, his name's Eric Fields, uh, we've been uh, best friends my whole life. He came up with the name Mercy Road. He was one of the first three people to help us start the church. He lives in Florida now. But he, he, he came down from the top, and he just helped me up and put his arm around me. And he's like, you're having a tough time, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks. I was, but he said, uh, don't worry, man. We got your back. And he, he helped me up, and he walked with me all the way up there. And I just remember thinking, that's real family. Being there when others need us to help them up. As we get into this passage this morning, I, I just want to tell you that the main concept that we've had on our board for uh, weeks has been to talk about how God provides throughout this series, and particularly this morning, how God provides family. The, the story of the birth of John the Baptist that we're going to look at is much greater. There's a miraculous story that occurs. She was barren. She has a child. He's going to pave the way for all of Jesus' ministry. It's going to be all this uh, amazing stuff. But the practical line is that he's going to give Zechariah and Elizabeth a child to provide a family for them. But he's actually doing something much greater. And even though we're going to talk about how God provides biological family in this passage, I want to talk about the bigger picture of what's really at st stake for the mission and movement of God in the world. See, the first thing I want to share with you is that how God provides this child, this family for Zechariah, is he promises it. Look at verse 13 with me. It says, but the angel said to him, Gabriel said, do not be afraid. He's like, I know you freaked out and you don't know what's going on, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. Here's the interesting thing. John, the word actually means God has been gracious. So that God heard your prayers and he has been gracious to you to give you a child. But scholars would tell you there's more going on than just talking about he was gracious to Zechariah and Elizabeth. He's also gracious to humankind. One of the world-renowned uh, Lucan scholars, John Nolan, writes, like the servant of Isaiah 49.5, his task will be to restore Israel to God coming ahead before the great day of the Lord. Another example, like Elisha, John will operate with Elijah's spirit and power, 2 Kings. And as the anticipated Elijah figure of Malachi 3, he will unite the generations of God. And yet further following the pattern of Daniel 12, he will turn many from ways of disobedience to wisdom and righteousness and expectation of the near approach at the end of the days. Now, some of you like, I heard scholar and checked out. What did he say? What's happening here is he's demonstrating that what God was gracious on wasn't just to give them a child, but was to provide the fulfillment of the role of Elijah that for hundreds of years the Jewish community had been waiting on, that was given the Spirit of God, that was to teach people about disobedience. That's why he didn't just eat honey and locusts and live in the desert. He was baptizing people, purifying, paying them the way so that people would wake up and see the need for a Messiah in their lifetime. He's going to be used by God and be gracious to humankind in a way they never thought possible. He's going to promise them 
that he's going to fulfill everything he set out to do, both their prayers and the hundreds of years of prophecy. He's going to fulfill and promise uh, both of them. It goes on in verse 14. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or ferment to drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents of their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He's graciously paving the way for everything Jesus was sent out to do. God promises that they're going to do that. You ever feel like God has spoken to you about something? Imagine Zachariah's here and he hears this and it's got to freak him out a little bit. And then he has to actually believe that God is telling him to do something. I, I had this happen in a very small way. You ever have the like moments where it's just a still small voice of the Lord? You're like, I think I heard that. But at the same time, I ate something bad for lunch. So I don't know if it was right or not. I remember uh, in, early on in the church, there was someone who came to the church who was new. His name was Ethan. Uh, Ethan would go on and partner with us to do all kinds of amazing ministry, help launch the Northwest Church, been part of our board for many years. But at that time, I didn't know any of that. I didn't know who Ethan was. And I just felt like uh, he, he had talked to me in the lobby and he said, hey, I want to talk to you about something. And so he invited us over for dinner and I just felt like we should go. And, you know, I don't always have the ability or time today to do some of those things, but I remember at that moment hearing from God say, yeah, we need to do that. And, and then the day came, and I'm waiting, and Lisa, my, my wife was one of those people that if she's not 10 minutes early somewhere, she's late. Anybody feel like that? She just, no, that's why you're at the later service today, is that it? Uh, I remember she, she just like freaks out, so she would never go someplace late. And so she's supposed to pick me up from work, and we were going to go there from the office, and I text her, hey, where are you? And she calls me. She's like, what are you talking about? I was like, we're supposed to meet this person for dinner, his family. He's like, oh, I totally forgot. Let's just cancel. We can't go. And I was like, I don't know why, but I just feel like we need to go. And so I went ahead. She's like, we're going to be like 45 minutes late. And I'm like, it's okay. God will get us through. We'll, we'll be fine. So I call him. I call Ethan. He says, you know what? Uh, the power's down in our entire house. We were thinking about canceling too. But we just felt like God was saying we need to still do this. And so the next thing I know, we went like 45 minutes late and had dinner in the dark with the, the Fernhopper family. All because I felt like, man, what if I think God is saying something here? In this passage, Zechariah is being told this promise of God, and he is going to have to walk through some of his doubts and fears about that very thing. But I'll tell you today, a lot of cool things happen because we had one simple dinner and, and followed the prompting of the Lord. What is God prompting you to do. Number two, if you're taking notes, God doesn't just promise it. Zechariah doubts it. <laughs> He's like, wait, are you sure? Like, do you see how old I am? <laughs> Have you, I mean, my wife, she's a young lady, but let's get real. This isn't going to happen. Look what he says. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. He's a smart man. He's been married a while. <laughs> and, and look what happens here. Because of his doubt, he's actually going to miss out on some things. Look, I'm not telling you today that you won't have doubts in life spiritually. You absolutely will. But acting on those doubts versus acting on faith often causes us to miss out on the very thing God's trying to do in our life. See, what, what ha happens here next is after this, his wife Elizabeth, excuse me, I'm reading the wrong passage, Verse 19, the angel said to him, I am Gabriel, so finally tells him his name. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Let's, let's get real. Gabriel had to feel pretty good about that. <laughs> like, you don't believe me? I'll show you, right? But what actually happens here in this passage is, he has just had like the best day of his life. He was on duty one of two times during the entire year. And one of the only times in his entire life, he's going to get to go burn the incense. And then he walks in and an angel of God is there. What's the one thing he wants to go do? Tell his wife everything that's happened. Uh, married couples here or family or friends that are here together. It, who's the talker in the relationship? Anybody got a talker? Come on now. I, I got... <laughs> We all know that, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I imagine that for some of you, like, he couldn't keep his mouth shut before, right? That's like, even if he thought about it, to say it out loud to the angel of God, like, could you imagine how hard it was for him to go home for months and not be able to talk about what he saw and experienced with his wife or his friends or his family? All because in that moment, he just didn't go, look, I have doubts, but whatever, you're God and I'm not. You see, as the passage, uh, the next section of it concludes here, it says, verse 21, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them, couldn't tell them why he was in there so long. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. He wants to tell him something so bad, he's trying to figure out how to make signs, how to draw things, just to communicate. I wonder how many times Zachariah, those next few months, learned a lesson of like, man, even when it's hard, learning to trust God because I'm not worshiping him for an outcome, I'm gonna choose faith over the outcome that I desire in my life. You see, I was thinking about this. Um, for some of us here this morning, some simple examples. We talked for five weeks about dating, marriage, tough parts of relationships. And I wonder how many of us have been through a, a breakup or maybe even a divorce, and you're like, I would love to trust again. I would love to try again. So long as, God, if I honor you in this area of my life, in the end, you give me what I want. You know, supermodel with super high IQ that loves me and everything about me and this perfect version of what I've envisioned for my life, or this perfect man that is so kind and knightly and all that he does. And if you give me all these things, then I will honor you. And God kind of always does it in reverse. How about you start with honoring me and trust me with the results, regardless if you get what you want or not? Because sometimes you don't even know what you need. Some of us today, if we apply this principle that Zechariah doubted, rather than, if we chose faith rather than doubt, if we just trusted him regardless of the outcome, I wonder what that would look like for you. I think of one of the simplest ways in our culture today. You know, if I talked on uh, sexual sin, everyone would understand. If I, if I talked on uh, sin of caring, not caring for people in need, we would understand that. But one of the, the greatest things I find in this season, this time of year in the American culture is to talk about greed, but nobody wants us to talk about that. One of the simplest ways that God asks us to follow him, and this isn't about this this morning, but I want to highlight this point of trusting the Lord regardless of the outcome is I want to, I want to give God uh, and not be greedy. I want to give and trust him with my resources. And the Bible teaches biblical tithing, which just means 10%. And I surrender that to the use of the Lord. And I, he's going to trust him that he'll do more with 90% than I would with 100%, right? But most American Christians would prefer to get to the end of the month and check the pocketbook and see do I have any money left over? I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, all right? I'm not after anything this morning, but one of the easiest, simplest ways in this season I see this play out is we often want results. We want what we want from God, and we want him to show he's going to give us what we want rather than trust him with what we need. It's one of the hardest parts of following God. And Zechariah, this priest, this godly, righteous man, it says, even he struggled with it. What does it look like to trust him in this season? Some of us, we pray to God and we want him to give us the results, but we don't trust him with what those results might be. Many of you know our story that um, when we moved here, we lost a child in the midst of planting a church. You probably know that part of our story. I've shared it many times. But maybe what you, you don't realize is um, the night that he passed away, the, I was angry at God was so angry that he caused all of this. And like, you told us to start a church. You told us to move across the country. We've been praying for healing. We've been praying for all this, and you didn't give us what we wanted. And in that moment, he said, I never promised you that you would get what you wanted. And he pointed me to the story of John the Baptist. You ever remembered how, what, how John the Baptist's life ends? We're looking how it begins. In a moment, we'll look how it ends. 
He, does, he doesn't get rewarded this side of heaven for everything that he's going to do to pave the way for all of Jesus' ministry. Don't you want to go, God, I won't doubt you. I will trust in faith. So long as in the end you make me like Abraham or Noah, where you show up in that time of need. But have you ever read Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Faith where you learn about Abraham and Noah and these great men and women of faith who they pray and God shows up and give them what's that, gives them what they've always desired? But then you read the end of Hebrews 11 and it talks about the others who were sawed in two, beheaded, lived destitute in caves out of fear for their life, martyrs of the faith. Do you know what the word martyr actually is? It's just the Greek word for witness. It literally just means they knew a Jesus and would tell about him. And it would cost them their lives. I feel like, man, we have dumbed down Christianity within our culture to a worship gathering like this. I didn't talk about this at the last service, but like a worship gathering like this, and we get really good about the business of like, if we have this many people greeting people and we have this right system in place, then people will have a positive experience and the customer service will be high enough that they will return. If we have great lighting, just enough haze, not too much haze, not, not, not enough haze, like then, then we'll reach more. And I love all those things and I want to use them to all to reach people for Christ. But I want to tell you this morning, the church of Jesus Christ is not based off of a weekend system. System. It, it, it's care for one another. It's spiritual family. To see somebody say, I, I actually care what happens to you. I want to be there for you in your time of need. And that's what in this passage, he has to trust that God is going to show up and he doubts it in that moment. But if you actually act by faith, you will get to see God show up and eventually Zechariah will get it. And God is going to fulfill his promise like he does. But here's the thing. God's going to give him a son. He's going to give him a biological family. But I was thinking about this. He's also going to take it away. See, the third point this morning is God gives spiritual family, but he, he can also take family. He can take things away. When the time of his service was completed, he returned home after his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. And for five months, she remained, remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said, and these days he's shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Go and give him that child. John the Baptist is going to be born, the cousin of Jesus, to pave the way for all of his ministry. Even Jesus needs community and family with him to help him out in his times of need. He's going to do all of this. But have you ever thought about the way he died? Matthew chapter 14. This is what God reminded me of that night that we lost a child. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. You might ask, well, how in the world would a passage like that encourage you on the night that you're, you're losing somebody? But it was because God showed me that I don't think John the Baptist got to heaven. It was like, man, I would have, wish I would have lived another 30 years and not paved the way for all of Jesus' ministry not live the calling that God had called me to live, not have been the person God wanted me to be. See, we don't get to determine our stories. We don't get to determine our outcome. We just get to determine how we trust and have faith in those moments of hardship in our life. To say, God, you're gonna have to provide to give us what we need. If I'm being totally honest this morning, um, I didn't wanna preach this morning. I was supposed to preach the sermon that we talked about for weeks called God Provides Family. And we've got this amazing breakfast out there and we want you to hang out and get to know each other and break through those walls and barriers that we all set up around each other and stop being isolated and lonely and turn to the body of Christ for community and family. And then I realized I was supposed to preach God Provides Family and then do a funeral for a 16-year-old daughter in our church this afternoon where family was taken away. And I realize this is really the story of, of how life works. That we all only have so many years, breaths on this planet. 
And we don't know if we're going to get 100 or we're going to get 10 or we're going to get 50. We don't know what it looks like, but we just have to choose what to do with the time that we have been given. If you're unfamiliar with Kara Cheatham, the daughter of our uh, children's pastor, Shalanda, that was in the video announcements earlier, she was the most amazing girl on the earth, like just the kindest person, always smiling and hugging and trusting the Lord and just one of those people that deserve so much more time. But I got to witness how God used Kara's life. In fact, this afternoon, we're doing a funeral here this afternoon, and, and Shalanda and James, James is also up here leading worship, and, and their oldest son, Isaiah, you've also seen leading worship. Uh, they invited anybody that wants to come out to the, the visitation or funeral today. The visitation is at 2 o'clock right in this room, and the funeral is at 4 o'clock. And, and we want to come and celebrate this young woman's life how she loved the Lord till the very end and trusted God through everything, regardless of the outcome. And I wonder how many people out there could actually say they would be willing to live like that. And I think the greatest testimony she should give, in fact, we have a short interview of her during her last week. And I want you to know till the very end that she just loved Jesus with all of her heart. That she, she said and trusted God and was so thankful for the family and the time that she had be get, been given. You say, how could somebody do that? How could somebody live that way and trust God going through all of that? Well, I want to tell you because it happens throughout the Bible when somebody has the Spirit of God in their life. Job lost everybody in his entire household. Job 1.21 says, the Lord gave and the Lord taken, has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Regardless of the outcome... Regardless of, of, of what happens in the end, we know in the end we're all going to meet our creator and it's what we've done with the time that we have been given that truly matters and that we as followers of Jesus are called to be there for one another in our times of need. And so many of you have reached out to James and Shalanda and the Cheatham family and reached out to Karen and reached out to everybody to say, how can we help? And thank you guys for living that way. But I want to tell you, there are some people here that have not experienced that type of family before. And I want you to know that you can have it. See, I thought we couldn't look at how Zechariah and Elizabeth get John the Baptist if we don't understand the bigger spiritual story that God wasn't just giving them a son. He was paving the way for the ministry of Jesus and he was putting in action the beginning of the local church that was to come. That God gives each of us, one another, as spiritual family. If you're taking notes, that's point number four. God gives each other as family. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. That if you have given your life to Jesus, he invites you into the family. That's why he uses all these analogies of spiritual family about our heavenly father, about the prodigal son who runs home and the father wraps his arms around him. He gets the fattened calf. We're having a party, puts a ring on his finger and a cloak on his back because he was lost and now he's found. There's some people here that you've only known loneliness and separation and isolation. And the truth is you don't have people that will love on you the way that James and Shalanda have had this last year. And I want to tell you, if there's ever any greater testimony to, to Kara Cheatham, it's that if you are sitting here today, that she would want more than anything, that you experience the type of spiritual family that she lived those 16 years with. People who actually cared about her and loved her no matter what she was going through. She actually told her mom during the last week that she saw all these stories online of how kids would often be mistreated when they were going through medical issues, that she struggled with cancer. And yet she was so thankful that her parents never did that, that she was there for them they were there for her in her time of need. We're meant to care and love for love each other. That's why the body of Christ is referred to as the family of God. So I want to invite you to do a few things as we close out. One of, is some of you, dude, you, you, you come to a place like this and it's not just here. It's like any church setting, like you, as soon as it's over, you like run to the car. I'm not judging. All right. But today, I'm asking, I'm challenging you to say I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go out there in a lobby that's too cramped and it makes me feel uncomfortable because I have to talk to somebody, but I'm going to do it because I'm going to trust that I need community in my life and I want to meet somebody. And I challenge those who are Christians here to meet people this today, to say hi to somebody, to get more than a name, begin to know them. 
I challenge you that this season, do you know during Christmas is the number one time where if you invite somebody to join with you here, that they'll actually show up. And so many people in our world are so alone and they're doing life by themselves. God didn't just provide a biological family. He provided spiritual family, the kind that walks down the steps, helps you up in your time of need, that shows up to the funeral and wails with you and celebrates life with you, that says, I'm there for you. I'm going to raise my kids with you, my grandkids with you. I don't care about the lights and the show and the entertainment of church anymore. I want to be the church that loves one another well, that gives a rip about somebody and what's going on in their life that sees a person who can't afford something this Christmas and does something about it, that sees somebody who's hurting, who's going through a divorce and doesn't avoid them, but reaches out to them, to see somebody whose kids are going through drug addiction and you say, we're here for you. We're gonna walk with you through this together. That's what spiritual family looks like. That's what the local church is meant to be. That's what the family on mission of Jesus Christ today in our world should look like. The beginning of the Christmas story together started with family being born, to be there for one another, that John the Baptist would pave the way for all of Jesus' ministry, but don't think it can't happen today, that God wants to pave the way in the hearts and lives of the people in your sphere of influence, and he wants to use you in that same way to usher in people to the kingdom of God, that they know the truth of Jesus Christ. They stop wasting their lives, leaving isolated and oppressed because nobody cares about them because you actually will. You say enough is enough. And I'm going to reach out and say something. We pray with me, God. God, I just, I want to acknowledge that you're here with us. And you know, I didn't do that at the last service. And I just feel like there's some people here right now that the truth is, um, This is like the last ditch effort. They they don't have a a church family. They they don't have you in their life. They don't have anybody that cares about them. And and God, you care about them more than any human being ever will. I would pray, Lord, that the Christians in the room right now would have just an ounce of the desire and compassion for those people that you have, Jesus. But it begins sometimes with us taking the first step. And so if you're here this morning and you don't know if you're a part of the family of God or not, I want to tell you there's a young woman that would want to tell you it's the best decision she ever made in her life was to join that family. And so if you're here today and you would like to start that process to join the family of God, to say, I want to follow you, Jesus, I invite you to pray this with me, to to surrender over to him. God, I admit this morning that I need you. I invite you into my life. I believe and receive your grace and forgiveness because of your work on the cross. And I surrender everything in my life to you as Lord. I desire to join the family of God this morning. Use me, Jesus. And for those in the room who are already Christian, maybe God has put somebody on your mind that you need to reach out to today to stop putting it off and care somebody. Let's pray for him right now, whoever that person is. God, help us to follow you as you're leading us in the world to care for others and be the true family of God that you desire us to be. We love you, Jesus. We give you this morning. We pray this in your name and all God's family said, amen.